Why are so many pharmacies closing in Boston's majority black and brown neighborhoods? Roxbury will soon be a desert after Walgreens closes its Warren Street location at the end of the month. It will be the fourth Walgreens to close in Boston in just over a year. And it joins a growing list of pharmacies, including CVS and Rite Aid, to shutter stores in underserved communities across the U.S. I'm joined now by Jenny Guatemuz, a professor of health and policy management at the University of California, Berkeley. So, Jenny, what's the overall trend here? This has been going on for a few years. Can you just uh, explain to us what's happening? Yes, of course. So, pharmacy in Black and Latinx neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, especially in urban centers, have been disproportionately closing in comparison to pharmacies located in white and high-income neighborhoods for at least the last decade. We've shown this in the 30 largest cities in the country, including Boston, in previous research that we've conducted. And why? what's, what's behind this trend? Is it uh, dropping prices or, tr or shrinking margins on pharmaceuticals, labor costs? What's behind this? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons behind that, including things like it's more difficult to keep pharmacists in the profession. It's, it's a hard job, especially during COVID. But the things that we've seen most often are differences in reimbursement rates. Um, if you have to think about what populations are served in these Black and Latinx neighborhoods, they are people that are disproportionately served by Medicaid. And these have, on average, lower reimbursement rates than um, folks that are paying for their medications with private insurance, and these people are more likely to live in more affluent neighborhoods. So that's one really big thing. There's also been a lot of changes in the pharmaceutical market, including mergers of retail chains, uh, chains buying each other out and therefore, and then closing pharmacies that are competing with one another. This happened back in 2018 when Walgreens purchased several hundred Rite Aid pharmacies. So as the market becomes more concentrated, it leaves behind a, a slew of closures, especially in these areas that are, because of how Medicaid works, more and other and insurers, more likely to have lower reimbursement rates and lower profits. And Rite Aid has filed for bankruptcy. They're going to close about 20% of their stores, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and what we've seen in the past is that when um, chains and walking is included um, beforehand, when chains close a school of pharmacies, they've been forced to close these pharmacies in Black and Latinx neighborhoods. I would not be surprised if this happens again. So these uh, retail pharmacies, they all have a drugstore component, but they also have other consumer goods they're selling. Um, so what's hitting that portion? I actually can't comment too much about um, that portion of it. I, I focus on the reimbursement of pharmaceuticals. I think one thing to question when retail chains say that that aspect of the business has also been closed is what proportion of pharmacies close outright? And what parts, what chains actually just close the, the pharmacy, the clinical aspect of it, and leave behind the bodega, the um, more consumer goods aspect of it. And then try to see if that's actually the case, that one part of the business is hurting more than the other. I imagine it's primarily out of reimbursement. So the actual drug, the drug distribution aspect of the pharmacies, and that's actually the part that needs to be regulated the most, because we're talking about access to medications and vaccinations and other clinical services. These are essential services, not just, you know, whether you can get your cookies at midnight. So you also mentioned, you know, a bodega, a smaller independent shop. Um, a lot of independent drug stores have closed over the past few decades, something like 50 percent over 30 years, according to some analysis. So how is it is it at all possible for any of those smaller stores to compete with these massive companies? Yeah, so, you know, pharmacies that are independently owned, what they do is they have a higher turnover. So they open in these neighborhoods and they actually are more likely to serve Black and Latinx neighborhoods in the first place. So they're pretty, they're important clinically speaking and for the provision of, of medications to these neighborhoods. That being said, because they can be more easily excluded from, from insurers networks of pharmacies that are included, quote unquote, preferred, or pharmacies that an insurer will um, allow its patients to use with lower cost sharing, they're more likely to close because they're excluded from the broader pharmacy um, reimbursement landscape. 
Uh, and we've shown this in the past that because they get, it's more difficult for them to compete and there's a whole other slew of things, including the way that they get their drugs and the cost of for them to operate. But even from an insurance perspective, they're more likely to be excluded. So I think there is a role for independent pharmacies, an important role to ensure that these patients, these folks in these Black and Latinx neighborhoods and low-income neighborhoods more broadly have access to their medications. But independents are more likely to close in the first place because of our insurance landscape and our healthcare landscape more broadly. So without policies to protect them, they won't be able to compete and serve these populations. So we did invite Walgreens to join this conversation and they declined, but they have put out a statement which they've been giving to all media, which essentially says when faced with a difficult choice to close location, several factors are taken into account, including our existing footprint, dynamics of the local market, changes in the buying habits of our patients and customers, among other reasons. In in their earnings call, their recent earnings call, Walgreens talks about stuff like serious shrinkage. Do you have a sense? Yeah. Are, are we talking shoplifting? Is that what we're talking about? Is that a problem for these neighborhoods? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I'll be honest, a little bit of a dog whistle um, with some racial overtones that um, Black and Latinx neighborhoods have higher um, retail theft existing in those pharmacies. I would like to see actual evidence of this happening disproportionately in these neighborhoods before I buy that. I think one aspect of their response um, about cons about consumer habits and buying habits, I think, could, is actually more about what type of patients come here and what type of scripts they're 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 getting. Are they getting high profit scripts? Are their scripts being paid by insurers that provide higher reimbursement rates. We should talk more about that and, and not into this kind of nebulous risk of, of shoplifting that has really, hasn't really been proven. Yeah, and they have been using it quite frequently, these large corporations, yeah. to talk about the money loss here. Jenny Guatemoz, yeah. thank you for sorting through this with us. Thank you so much for having me. Now we turn to the community impact of the closure. Residents of Roxbury gathered Friday to protest the pharmacy closing. Reverend Minyard Culpepper is one of those leading the charge to keep the store open. He joins me now. Reverend, can you tell me what is the ask that you had of Walgreens in this protest? Thanks for having me on, Liz. Uh, the ask in the beginning and still is, uh, was to keep this Walgreens open uh, because we think this is, in my opinion, a hub Walgreens. And when I say a hub Walgreens, I mean that uh, when the Mattapan Walgreens closed, uh, many of those customers came to the Quincy and Warren Street Walgreens. When the Dudley Street uh, Walgreens closed, Many of those customers came to the Quincy and Warren Street Walgreens. When the Geneva Avenue Walgreens closed, many of those customers came to the Warren and Quincy uh, Walgreens because it's centrally located. And I've gone there at times and there have been customers at the pharmacy all the way around the back of the store. And so we think this Walgreens is critical to keep open because of the impact that it has on uh, those that not only live in proximity to it, but those that are able to uh, drive down from Mattapan down Blue Lab to Warren Street, or st straight up Dudley Street on Warren Street, or straight down Geneva Ave. It's centrally located. The other thing about it is there are many seniors, many senior homes that are within walking distance from this Walgreens. Right across the street, there's a, a Martin Luther King Senior Home Development. Right across the street, uh, a minute walk to Walgreens. And then the other thing that was really interesting about uh, Walgreens' decision is they chose uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's holiday, the birthday holiday, to close this Walgreens on. I, I did so, know, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty tone deaf to say the least. Um, they are large. Most people are aware of that, but they are a massive global operation. It's Walgreen Boots. It's a worldwide conglomerate. Did
Did they respond? They did postpone that particular closing just to the end of this month. But did they respond in any way to you other than that? No, no. We wrote them a letter uh, and delivered, hand delivered to the Marlboro office. Uh, we got a letter back from the, the corporate offices in Deerfield, Illinois, and we're engaging with them to talk about a smoother transition uh, once the 31st comes. Uh, you know, we think Walgreens, if you're going to close, uh, we need to figure out ways that the seniors can be transported back and forth or that the medications can be delivered to the seniors. One of the interesting things about this Walgreens, staff was actually taking the medications to the seniors' homes because the senior homes were so close to it. So they would walk it over to the seniors who were what we call uh, sick and shut in, walk it to them at their homes. And so that is pretty amazing. I mean, that's operating almost like an independent drugstore or really a community, a community store. It's interesting that you say that because uh, we're working with with several groups that are working on. And I'm not sure whether it's going to be able to happen this soon. A Walgreens franchise said doing research into a Walgreens franchise. Uh, We're also talking with Frederick Williams over at Whittier Health Street. Uh, groundbreaking pharmacy at that health care clinic. And no one's really thought about the significance of Frederica Williams uh, opening that pharmacy. You know, people, I think, folks just looked up because uh, Frederica is always ahead of the times. So-, so when she opened this pharmacy, no one thought about how significant that pharmacy would be in this community. But you know, for, for those, been, though, who can't, you know, Walgreens already is saying, well, we still got one not that far away, a mile. That's, you know, a 20 minute walk for some people. You mentioned elderly. You you know, there are a lot of people for whom that is a big deal. And deliveries may or may not do it from a Walgreens. Um, and there are a lot of other needs that people have they want to just be able to get very close to. So how do you fill that gap? Well, we're working on it, you know. We're talking with DoorDash. Uh, we think DoorDash could fill a void there where uh, DoorDash, because they already have the uh, mechanism to make deliveries, that we're asking DoorDash to help with this transition and to make some deliveries uh, on their own. And so we're reaching out. We're working with a group, uh, a national group, uh, the Hill Collaborative, they focus, they've been focusing on farmer issues. But now that we've raised this issue with regard to the Walgreens and the pharmacies, they're turning their attention to the pharmacy issues. We're working with a group of pastors because this is not just a local issue. Uh, the more pastors we talk to around the country, the more we find that this is a national issue. And this is a national issue hitting underserved communities. Reverend, uh, for those who are not that familiar in this area, explain the neighborhoods. This is for Walgreens. It's the fourth closing, or it will be the fourth closing. So can you give us a sense of these neighborhoods? Yeah. And so when I mentioned this Walgreens being a hub for the other Walgreens that had closed, uh, Mattapan is uh, virtually a mile away from this Walgreens down the street. Uh, Dudley Station is even closer than Mattapan. Uh, That's part of Roxbury, uh, part of a little on the fringe of Dorchester, but it's really Roxbury. Right. Uh, The Walgreens are... No, I was going to say, for people who don't understand, we're not talking, as one person told The Globe, it was pretty compelling. Just, I'm not talking about a sneaker store or I need a sweater. This is blood pressure medicine. This is a diabetes strip. Help us understand, what is at stake if people aren't getting it and they think, oh, you know, you close a Walgreens, so there's another one. What's really at stake here for these communities? I mean, for me, I think, and many of the pastors that we've been talking to, for us, it's a matter of life or death, uh, not to have your medication. For many folks that are dependent on that medication, especially with high blood pressure, uh, without that medication, we know that high blood pressure can lead to a stroke. 
uh, without that diabetes medication, we know that that can lead to seizures. So for us, it's a matter of life or death. And the significant thing that, that, that troubles me is that uh, many folks aren't troubled uh, unless it has a direct impact on them. Look, the Attorney General, uh, Andrea Campbell, wrote a letter to Walgreens. Uh, we're thankful for the help that she's given us. Uh, the governor's office is working with us. Senator Markey's office, uh, I saw a draft letter that they're sending to Walgreens. The city councilor, council member Anderson, convened a, a hearing, a listening session. This group that decided to protest came out of that listening session. So, Reverend, Ryan, it, it, well, yeah. it does sound like you are going up against a mammoth organization. These retail pharmacies are huge. So it does sound like you are going to need all the government input that, that you can get all that force behind you. Reverend Culpepper, we have to leave it there. I thank you very much. Let me just say this. Uh, we have a David mentality. David went up against Goliath. When everyone thought that Goliath was going to rule and conquer, David conquered Goliath. We have a David mentality, and we plan. We don't need to conquer a Walgreens, but we do need to develop a partnership that is able to serve those that are dependent and that have trusted Walgreens in the past. We will win this victory. Thank you, Reverend. Appreciate that, and appreciate your time. Thank you, Liz. Bye now.